Hello again, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar on consumption trends in Europe and beyond. We are at the two minute mark. Uh, while the participants continue to join in, I just start off the proceedings here. So uh, before we start, just a quick uh, reference that we are going to be recording this session for future availability on, on, on different platforms, so, so you know. And uh, before we start, just a quick update on some of the upcoming SETA events that will also be organized by the next gen. So first up, we have the sustainability contest. The success of our 2023 sustainability contest has given up, given us the you know uh, encouragement to continue to dream and to plan for the sustainability contest for 2024. We have already officially launched it using our uh, our LinkedIn on our LinkedIn platform. The theme for this year's contest is fueling the future of coffee and this is the same theme which is uh, which which uh, the same theme which is being used by the SCTA uh, forum and dinner this year which will be held in uh, Basel in October 3rd and uh, 4th so it focuses on uh, the impact which regenerative agriculture and technology can have on driving coffee uh, industry forward and uh, we are thankful for all the sponsors that we have till now which include the Swiss Coffee Traders Association JD Beats Hamburg Coffee Company Sukafina, Curic Dr. Pepper, Inc., Enveritas, and Vidya Gobal. If you'd like to support this sustainability initiative, please do reach out to any of us at the SCT and Next Gen Council. And it is with your support that we'll be able to make an even bigger impact on the coffee community. Also coming up will be the world of coffee uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen this year. Having seen the success of our events in the world of coffee, Athens and in uh, Milan, we would be also arranging a event on the evening of 28th in the Copenhagen city center. This would be another opportunity for the larger coffee uh, community to come together and network over an unforgettable evening. So we look forward to seeing you there. And finally, we'll also have a meetup in Geneva. This would be on the 2nd of May, so very soon. We look forward to seeing many of you there as well. Without further delay, I'd like to just quickly present the uh, panelists for today's webinar on consumption trends in Europe and beyond. First up, we have Paul. Paul is the executive director of the British Coffee Association. He represents the BCA on the ECF executive committee as well. An agriculture graduate with postgraduate qualifications in law, he has 30 years of experience in trade associations covering policy, technical, and contractual issues. Previously, he has also served as the president of the EU body CELCA, CELCAA, the European Liaison Committee for Agriculture and Agri-Food Trade. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. Next up, we have Pavan. Pavan Adarsh has been with Olam for Olam Food Ingredients for over 13 years. In his current role as VP in OFI's Central Coffee Trading Desk, he handles the coffee research amongst other responsibilities. He holds a bachelor's diploma from the uh, Institute of Technology in Roorkee and a PGDM in, from IM Calcutta. Previously, he was part of the grains division in Singapore and was instrumental in building the wheat and the corn fundamentals. Thanks, Pavan, for joining us. And finally, last but not the least, we have Holger, Holger Preibisch. Uh, Holger is the CEO of the German Coffee Association, which is based in Hamburg since 2006. German Coffee Association represents coffee companies along various coffee uh, value chains across the chain. He holds a German and a British law degree and previously he has worked as the office manager for Professor Helge Brown. She was a member of parliament in Berlin. Moving on, during the webinar, just a quick reminder for all the participants, we look forward to receiving your questions as we have set aside 15 to 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A session. Without further ado, would love, would, I would now like to invite Pavan to take over the platform and speak on the global consumption trends in the world. Pavan, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Abhishek. Over to you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so if you can move on to the slides, Abhishek. Just a quick uh, disclaimer. And yeah. So uh, I'll probably uh, start off from a bird's eye view of uh, the global coffee consumption. Uh, as you know, uh, you know, the chart on the left sort of indicates uh, the way the coffee is consumed. We're talking about 1.2 trillion cups of coffee that is uh, consumed globally every year. 
And uh, as you can see, a large chunk of that is uh, really through roasting ground, which is all too familiar to all of us. Uh, apart from that, uh, you do have uh, a soluble uh, format in which uh, the coffee is consumed. And we have some new entrants, uh, you know, in the past uh, decade or so, which is, you know, fast catching up. So one is really the pods uh, market and uh, you have the ready to drink uh, kind of a segment, which is also fast uh, growing. Uh, just again, uh, to give you uh, uh, a good uh, color on uh, the kind of value you're talking when, you, when you're referring to coffee on a retail market. Uh, we're talking about $115 billion of, uh, you know, coffee consumption. Uh, so that's, uh, that puts coffee in one of the expensive brackets as far as uh, commodities are concerned. And uh, really, uh, while the roasting ground is uh, at a lower price point, uh, just given the volume, it still occupies a predominant share in the retail uh, uh, global coffee market as well. We can move to the next slide, Abhishek. Yeah. Uh, speaking about uh, production and consumption, uh, like most commodities, I think coffee is also fairly concentrated on the production side of things uh, uh, between uh, Brazil, Vietnam, uh, Central America, and Colombia. We're really talking about three-fourths of the total coffee consumption. Uh, we have an honorable mention of Indonesia, which is not far behind. Uh, Colombia. So really, it is a fairly concentrated pocket of uh, coffee production that we're seeing. And uh, on the consumption side as well, uh, we do have Europe, uh, North America, Brazil and Japan really uh, taking up around two thirds of the global consumption of coffee. Uh, while the overall profile of uh, production has broadly remained uh, uh, the same across the years, you know, between the, you know, producing countries, uh, the landscape on the consumption side has sort of changed in a material way. Uh, there's been uh, a considerable amount of growth in the emerging uh, countries and emerging clusters, and they have really taken the share uh, away from the traditional consuming markets like Europe, North America and Japan. Uh, more than that in the uh, coming slides because, uh, you know, the emerging uh, clusters is a very important theme in the coffee consumption, uh, particularly in the future. Uh, and just before, uh, just another point on the production uh, uh, of the total global consumption, uh, gl total global production, uh, you have two different coffees, which is Robusta and Arabica. Uh, the larger chunk is uh, really the Arabica. You're talking about 55-ish uh, to around 57%, and the rest is uh, Robusta. And uh, you will see that uh, that share is also sort of gearing towards the Robusta production. We'll explore the reasons why in the coming slides. And uh, the next slide, Abhishek. Uh, well, I've... Uh, I've been mean, uh, with the coffee uh, markets for, you know, uh, over a decade. And, uh, you know, we coffee analysts, uh, if there's one thing that we coffee analysts can hang our hat on, that's really the very steady growth uh, in the coffee consumption. Uh, you know, the orange line on the chart of the on the left indicates the steady growth of around two to two and a half percent that coffee has been maintaining for uh, several decades. Uh, however, post COVID, that particular trend has changed in a meaningful way. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, post COVID, the purple dotted line is the actual consumption that is sort of deviated from the baseline uh, uh, coffee growth. Uh, and that's not without reasons. So one of the main reasons is definitely the way the coffee is being consumed. Uh, there is a fair chunk of uh, out of home consumption in the overall coffee market and that has say, taken a significant uh, hit. So that has really, you know, trimmed the overall consumption growth uh, quite a bit. Uh, apart from that, if you look at the chart on the right side, uh, the purple line indicates the overall price of coffee. That's really the weighted average price of coffee between Arabica and Robusta. And you can see that uh, when you peg it against the average, we are at elevated coffee prices. And in fact, uh, you know, this month, uh, the, both the coffee markets have rallied significantly and we are probably closer to the 200 mark than the 150. So all in all, it is a very uh, rich environment uh, 
you know, when you look at the historical prices of coffee. And in addition, uh, the uh, red bars that you see is the interest rate. Uh, that's another factor which has been burdening the overall uh, wallets of the consumer. So a combination of, uh, you know, a high interest rate environment uh, coupled with uh, high uh, coffee prices and the changing consumer trends has really, you know, changed the overall, has pivoted the overall uh, coffee uh, trend towards a flat line than the traditional uh, growth. Moving on. Well, uh, it is, uh, well, all is not doom and gloom. Uh, I know it is uh, sort of a, you know, dim picture when you talk about uh, the current coffee consumption narrative. Uh, but there are some very strong uh, underlying themes which are still there and uh, which are, uh, you know, sure to propel some of the coffee consumption in the future. And one such theme is really the strong growth in coffee consumption, particularly in the emerging economies. The chart on the left indicates the share of the emerging country consumption in the overall coffee consumption. So you can see that uh, we have really moved from about a third of uh, overall coffee consumption to really almost a half. That's a significant uh, increase in the share of the emerging uh, basket in the overall consumption. And uh, the orange line below that indicates the producer's uh, consumption share, which is also increasing in line because that's only a subset of the emerging uh, countries. So that is an important theme and that is really one of the strong growth drivers as we'll see in the coming slide. Uh, but before that, uh, one uh, important implication of this change or rather of this uh, share increase of uh, emerging countries is the way the production is now gearing towards more robustness. Uh, as you know, uh, Robusta, uh, most of these emerging countries, you know, it could be the cultural palette, uh, it could be uh, the cost, they're more geared towards the Robusta consumption and accordingly, the production has also switched gears and moved more towards the Robustas. Uh, in addition, Robusta, being Robusta, the more robust coffee uh, is grown in the lower altitude regions and it can be quickly irrigated. It is... Uh, it probably has a better cushion against uh, weather events uh, which have been uh, of high frequency of late. And uh, because it is of a, in, grown in a lower altitude, the efficiencies of harvesting are also much higher. So for all these reasons, definitely the production is also geared towards Robusta at this point. And uh, it has become a very, very important uh, factor in uh, the overall coffee market. As a case in point, the yellow dot there indicates that, uh, you know, there has been a dip in the overall production of Robusta and uh, the markets have accordingly reacted in a very strong way. Uh, as you know, the Robusta prices are probably at record highs. And that this that sort of uh, tells you how strong, uh, 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 how strong a place the Robusta consumption sort of holds in the global markets uh, today. Moving on. Uh, again, uh, just uh, just to nail down and double down on that, uh, you know, importance of uh, emerging country uh, uh, consumption, uh, the chart on the left sort of indicates uh, the coffee consumption per capita uh, among the various geological, uh, ge geographical uh, clusters and uh, the bubbles there indicate the population. So very clearly, some of the most populous uh, uh, clusters are very low on the overall per capita consumption. So that's a big opportunity. There's a lot of latent potential in these uh, countries. And honestly, if you are able to tap and which will potentially be tapped in the future, that can really sponsor a lot of growth in the overall uh, uh, coffee in the future. Uh, again, as a case in point, if you look at China and Turkey, uh, the overall imports have been pretty strong even in periods uh, like uh, post-COVID, where I've already indicated that uh, the growth of the overall global uh, coffee uh, consumption has been uh, rather lukewarm. Uh, you can see that uh, the emerging baskets have really performed uh, pretty well. Moving on. Uh, just to switch gears uh, quickly uh, to the patterns of consumption, uh, there are several patterns which are probably noteworthy. Uh, one is really the auto form, like I've indicated. It has taken a significant dip uh, during the COVID period. 
uh, a lot of that share has been captured by the retail side of uh, this uh, retail side of the coffee market and on the traditional and uh, pods, uh, the RNG segment has been declining. And that decline was uh, accelerated as a lot of pods markets have taken uh, the share away from the traditional RNG. Now, are these patterns are particularly important uh, as we move into you know, matured markets like Europe and uh, North America. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, Abhishek. So if you take the case of Europe, I mean, uh, from a volume point of view, it is a pretty uh, mature market. As you can see, really between 2010 to 2023, this really not much of a volume growth. Uh, but I think the the more important factor or the more important metric that we'll have to be analyzing in these markets is really the way the coffee is consumed. Uh, as you can see, uh, while the overall volume is still pretty much the same, the way the coffee is consumed is materially changing. From the traditional RNG, now the share is being taken away by some of the new entrants like the pods, the ready to drink market. And I think an analysis and uh, a grip around these particular patterns can really uh, guide us better in the uh, overall uh, you know, matured markets, which still hold a significant part of the overall uh, global consumption. So that's uh, that's really my uh, global overview. Uh, I would think, uh, uh, this would probably serve as a beachhead uh, so for uh, the upcoming uh, sessions. Uh, uh, I think I'll hand over the dais to Olga, who will probably uh, speak about specific markets in Germany. Thank you so much for heading over to me. Very fantastic data. And now we will take a deep dive into Europe's consumption and in particular into the German consumption, the German coffee market. Within the next slides, I would like to convince you that Germany is a coffee nation. Many people believe the Germans would drink only beer. And yes, we drink quite a lot of beer. We drink per capita per year, 90 liters per capita per year. The better news for all of us is we drink even more water than beer, 123 liters per capita per year. But the very best news for all of us is we drink more than 160 liters coffee per capita per year. So coffee is the most consumed beverage in Germany. And uh, this can only be done because we import quite a lot of coffee. Around 1 million tons of green coffee are imported per year into Germany. So Germany is the second largest importer of green coffee in the world after the US. Here you can see where the green coffee comes from. The ranking is Brazil, Vietnam, Honduras, Peru, Ethiopia, Uganda, Colombia, India, Indonesia. And here comes a fun fact, Belgium. So uh, I just uh, took it into my, to my presentation as a small fun fact. Uh, the German Authority for Statistics reports between all these coffee producing countries year by year, Belgium as a coffee producing country because of the port of Antwerp for sure, but they don't know that Antwerp is not a coffee producing destination. So, and we also have China in our ranking, PNG, Guatemala and so on. So if you add all this, you come to around 1 million tons of green coffee. What happens with these uh, 1 million tons of green coffee we import? Um, to simplify the message, half of our imports we consume by ourselves. The other half of our imports we process and re-export. And you can see it uh, in the green column on the right side for the year 2023 export. The second line, we are a world champion in decaffeinating. We export around 120,000 tons of decaffeinated coffee. Uh, then also roasted coffee. We export 250,000 tons of roasted coffee. And also um, when you look uh, further down the column, um, solid and liquid extracts and also preparations. So uh, more than 60,000 tons of uh, soluble coffee in different forms we also export. 
um, following the, the statement of the ICO, Germany is the biggest exporter of processed coffee in the world. So with these data, please follow my, my conclusion. We are a coffee nation in Germany. Coffee is the most, pro most consumed beverage. We are the second biggest importer of green coffee, and we are the biggest exporter of processed coffee. And since we are coffee nation, there is also a coffee association in Germany, which I represent. We do have 360 companies along the whole entire coffee value chain. We really start at the early beginning of the value chain, representing um, sustainability organizations. We do have uh, uh, the trading houses in our membership, shipping lines, banks, insurances. We have uh, all major brands in our uh, membership, as well as around 200 specialty roaster. And we have the manufacturers of coffee machines, the manufacturers of um, coffee uh, roasting equipment and also coffee online sh shops. But we also have retailers in our um, membership like Aldi or Edeka. Next chart, please. We have increased our membership in the last uh, 10, 12 years, uh, almost tripled from 128 members to more than 360 members. And what are we doing as a German Coffee Association? We have five columns. What we do first is a quality insurance. So uh, like uh, OTA, um, Acrylamid Furan, we have lots of databases. I, I strongly believe we have the biggest database for all these nasty components, how to handle them. We offer our members uh, lots of events, uh, more than 33 events per year, having 120 speakers every year on our stages. And we have a huge portfolio in sustainability compliance. We offer a joint grievance mechanism worldwide. We have uh, special projects uh, for, sustain for sustainability in Brazil and Colombia. Uh, we have risk assessment uh, to be compliant with the German due diligence law and uh, the EUDR, which is coming into application end of this year. We have particular tools uh, to support our members to be compliant with UDR. We offer legal advice uh, on all topics uh, regarding coffee, and we do have a huge market research and data based on coffee consumption. I think it's the biggest coffee consumption study across Europe we have. We ask more than 10,000 consumers every year, where do you drink? How do you drink your coffee? How much do you pay? What do you believe about coffee, etc.? And uh, some data out of this market research I have brought with me. Next chart, please. And also next chart. So with this chart, uh, we start uh, to look at the coffee consumption in, in, in Germany. We look at the coffee consumption locations. Around 80% of the coffee is consumed in a private surrounding. So at home or at families or friends, home or in the home office. The other side is consumption out of home. Roughly 20% is consumed out of home. Consumed out of home means gastronomy, workplace, canteen, cafeteria, coffee shop, etc. When you when we look now into the next chart, we see a split between these 80% and the 18%. So here we go, um, have, have a deeper look at home, at the own how we consume. Uh, two out of three cups, 66% of uh, our cups are consumed at the own house, at home, own flat apartment home. At friend's place, we consume uh, around 7%. In the home office, we consume 7.8, let's say 8%. Then we look further uh, at the workplace, directly or close to the desk, to the work kitchen, so in the coffee kitchen, for example, at the workplace is uh, around 9%. Work training place in canteen or mensa is 3%. So if you add the 7.6% working home, working at workplace and working training place, you can say around 18, 19% of the coffee consumption takes place at work. Very surprisingly for, for, for many uh, market observers is that the gastronomy has only a market share in Germany of 
percent of all the cotton consumption. And if you have a, a look on the top right, there's a list. What do we cover with this gastronomy? So it's a canteen, it's a coffee shop, bakery, hospital, kiosk, hotel, restaurant, takeaway, cafe, restaurant, motorway, rest stop, gas station, retirement home. So all these is under 4.5% of the coffee consumption in Germany. Not because we drink so less coffee in gastronomy, but we drink so much coffee at home or at the workplace that even the gastronomy is only 4.5%. Next chart, please. Now we look at these 4.5%. How are they split between these uh, typical places of gastronomy? And there we can see that the bakery has uh, 36% market share in the gastronomy. And uh, this is also surprising because um, the next one um, on this uh, wheel is 10% uh, for the coffee bar, for the coffee shop. Um, opposite to the US or to uh, UK, we don't have so many coffee shops. Uh, just to give you two figures, we have uh, 45,000 bakeries in Germany but we have only 150 Starbucks in Germany. So uh, uh, the bakery is in, in Germany, actually uh, that one, which is uh, a coffee shop uh, in other countries. So next chart. Now we come to the home consumption. Which coffee machines does the coffee consumer has in the household? And here you can see that the filter coffee machine you can find in 42% of the households. The fully automatic coffee machine is in every third household. 32, 33% do have a fully automatic coffee machine at all. The, the, uh, the, um, the place of uh, coffee pot machine, instant and also capsules machine is uh, around 20%. So in every fifth household, you can find a pot machine or some instant coffee or a capsule machine. Um, when we look uh, on the very uh, right side, you can find that the classic espresso machine is a market share of 4% of the households. Be aware, this um, chart shows you um, in, many house, in, in, in uh, how many households you find these coffee machines. Um, many households have more than one brewing system. So these figures, uh, if you add them, show more than 100%. And uh, this chart does not show how intense these coffee machines are used. Um, you can see it, uh, for example, with the capsule machine, um, 17, 18% of the households do have uh, the capsule machines, but the market share, if you look on the market share of capsules uh, in the coffee market uh, in volume, it's around uh, six, uh, 7%. So this chart here shows how many households do have uh, which brewing system at all. Next one, please. Here you can see which kind of coffee drinks uh, are prepared at home and also by which machine. We just look at the very left uh, column. Total, um, what we see here, black coffee, 32% um, means actually that 32% uh, of all coffee cups consumed at home are what we call black coffee. So a regular coffee, to even simplify it, it's, it's filter coffee, you, you can assume. 10% are espresso, lombo, cafe crema. We call it black coffee specialties. Um, then we do have a coffee with milk, 44%, and also coffee specialties with milk. So you can see the German consumer really loves to have milk in its coffee. And following down the column, you also can see that um, uh, almost half of the coffee Cups consumed at home are sweetened, either with sugar or with sweetener. So the German consumer loves to have coffee, half of it with milk and also almost half of it with um, sweet. Okay, next one. 
With this graph, I would like to illustrate uh, the price segments of roast and ground and whole bean coffee in Germany. Um, this is euro per kilogram, including VAT and including the German coffee tax. So there is two euro 19 uh, on kilogram roast and ground or roasted coffee. So if you see that, uh, for example, uh, coffee is sold for 10 euros in Germany per, per kilo, um, you can uh, take off uh, two euro fifteen for taxes. So, um, just to give you a, a brief calculation, and here you can see that twelve percent of the roasted coffee sold in Germany is under seven euro per kilogram, including German coffee tax and include, including uh, German VAT. VAT. And um, you can also see 48% uh, of the coffee is under 11 euro per kilogram. So coffee is actually not very expensive in Germany. When we look at the higher price coffee uh, on the bottom of this chart, you can see that 8.6% of the coffee, roasted coffee is sold for prices higher than 25 euros per kilogram. And in the next charts, we look uh, at this uh, segment of uh, 25 euros per kilogram. And um, you might not be surprised, but it's also interesting to see it um, in the category of the whole bean, the market share of coffee, which is sold for 25 euros per kilogram or higher prices is higher here, 13% than compared to the coffee roast and ground, where the market share is around 6% of the coffee, which is being sold for a price higher than 25 euros per kilogram. Moving on, please. Who buys the coffee, which is cheaper than 25 euros per kilogram? And who buys the coffee, which is uh, higher than 25 euros per kilogram? Um, to make the message very short, Buyers of high price coffee are typically younger, they are better educated, and they have a higher income. This, this one you can clearly see on this chart. Next one. And since this is a session, a webinar here of the next gen by SCTA, I also brought some uh, charts with me about generations. Let me look uh, at the very left column. Here you can see that uh, around 84%, if you add these 8, 21, and uh, 57 together, around 84% of all coffee consumers, of the whole population, ex excuse me, 84% of the whole population being 16 or elder, uh, consume coffee regularly, 84%. Then we have a look on the generation set. And there you can see that uh, the share of the uh, uh, people in generation set who drink regularly coffee is significantly lower, 16 plus 19 plus 26, around 60%. Yeah? Um, and then if you go up uh, with the elder generation, um, uh, again, there are significantly higher portions of people in that generation who drink coffee regularly. Um, this is not really surprisingly. We have seen this chart, you can say, in the last 15 years, it's almost the same. So we still truly believe that the generation, which is now the younger one, having less regular coffee drinkers uh, compared to the elder ones, will enter the coffee consumption in the next years in the same way as Generation X or Baby, baby Boomer did uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Next one. And uh, here uh, we can show which kind of coffee drinks each generation prefers. The left one is again the total um, coffee consumer um, um, so um, 
all th this one shows um, 100 percent. Uh, each column is 100 percent of the coffee cups being consumed by the uh, generation. So you can say 16 percent of all coffee consumers drink um, white um, white uh, coffee. So, sorry, we do not translate it here. I can see. Um, so weiße Kaffee Spezialitäten, 16 percent means uh, cappuccino, latte macchiato, etc. Uh, then we have with the 11% black coffee specialties. This means lungo, espresso, etc. coffee with milk. And these columns you can see again, Generation Z consumes different coffee beverages than all other generations. Um, they drink with more milk, 34% well, is coffee with milk, uh, with foamed milk, so uh, cappuccino, latte macchiato, etc. And the 31% is um, coffee with milk. And you can see here very clear that uh, um, the younger ones love to have coffee with foam, milk foam. And the older the generation is, less milk foam is included in the coffee. So yes, there are significant differences in the generations, um, but we have seen these uh, exactly the same in the last uh, 15 years. Next one, and this is my last one. Um, we also took a look uh, at the milk, which is added to coffee, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have seen that the younger generation loves to add milk or foamed milk into the coffee. Uh, are there differences between generations? Uh, which kind of milk is added to coffee? Yes, definitely. Generation Z is significantly more likely to use whole milk. They love to have vegan milk alternatives, and also they use more lactose-free milk. In big contrast, uh, Generation Z uses much less uh, coffee cream or condensed milk. So this was my view into the German coffee market. We are a coffee nation. Where do we drink coffee? We drink a lot of coffee at home. We drink a lot of coffee at uh, our working places, in the home office or at the desk, in the canteen. And there are differences in the generations, how coffee is being used. The filter coffee machine is still the main machine at home, followed by the fully automatic machine. So if you have any questions uh, on the German coffee market, happy to answer. And with this, I move on from Germany to the UK. Paul, my colleague from UK, will continue to give an insight about the UK consumer trends. Thank you. Olga, thank you very much indeed. That was that was a great dive into the to sort of the detail and slightly envious of some of the statistics that you're you're able to sort of get to. But uh, um, some some interesting similarities, I guess, but some probably still one or two contrasts as well. So we'll we'll sort of move into look at the UK situation. Uh, if we can move on to the that's it. Thank you. So a quick overview of the of, of the UK market. Um, overall consumption approximately 100 million cups a day. Holger talked about Germany being a coffee nation. I think the UK is considered historically to be a tea nation. Um, I think now we're very close to parity between tea and coffee on a uh, on a daily sort of basis. Um, around 30% of the UK population drink more than three cups a day. But interesting, I think we've seen the statistics change slightly over time so that the percentage of, of people drinking more than four cups a day has come down slightly. And I think that perhaps is evidence that, that some of the um, uh, points about uh, too much consumption, too much coffee consumption, or too much caffeine in particular, uh, has, has hit home. So people have moderated at the higher level uh, slightly over, over the years. Uh, we'll come on in a moment to talk a little bit more in detail about the coffee shop situation, which is perhaps a contrast with, with Germany. Uh, but here we have 81% of consumers who are say that they visit coffee shops on at least a weekly a weekly basis. Now, obviously, the, the UK doesn't have such a big consumption um, either per capita or, or in total as, as Germany. And, and our consumption per capita is only around 60% of 
of the overall EU average. But we, we are still the 10th biggest uh, coffee consumer globally. Um, in, in terms of green coffee, we're bringing in around about 100, 150 to 160,000 uh, tonnes uh, a year. Uh, we're also exporting around 20,000. And then alongside that, we have about 80,000 tonnes of roast and ground and soluble coffee coming in. But again, to contrast, that was probably 60,000 tonnes of roast ground and, and soluble being exported as well. So the UK is very much a, a market of, of both import and, and export, particularly in the, in the value added side. Um, we've got one or two figures. Sorry, just quickly back on that first slide. We've got one or two figures that, that, that look at things post-COVID, post-Brexit as well, which obviously we've, we've had to factor in. And I think it's it's fair to say that if you look at the figures from 2023, the recovery in the coffee sector, and we'll look at it in a little bit more detail in a moment, has outperformed the hospitality sector as a whole. If you look at the, the recovery, particularly, I guess, from COVID and then also factoring in the, the cost of living as, as we've seen in the last couple of years. So moving on to that next slide. And we've talked about average consumption here. You'll see a bar chart that shows average consumption. That's average number of cups, cups of coffee, sorry, uh, consumed. Uh, the age range is 18 to 34, 35 to 54, and then the over 55s. Um, from three surveys that, that BCA has run over the past few years in 2018, 2020, and again in 2021. The 2021 is the only, obviously, the only one that comes post COVID. Um, and we'll see a slight decrease in all of those three age sectors in terms of the average consumption. But I think we might also reflect when we get towards the end that this may also show the, the sort of the differences in or the different forms in which people are consuming coffee and, and maybe which we haven't been able to pick up in, in the statistics. And then if you look at the at the pie chart on the on the right hand side, you'll see the split of where coffee is is consumed in, in the UK and, and again some, some differences with what you saw from, from, from Germany. So our biggest consumption area is in home as, as it was in Germany but only 55%. Uh, around 18% is consumed out of home in, in shops, in cafes, in restaurants and in bars and around 27% is consumed within the within the workplace. And that can be vending machines in workplaces, it can be staff canteens, it, it can be simply kitchens in offices. If we look at those figures and compare them to, to the sort of the pre-COVID period, we'll see that the at-home figure has risen by around 5%. Uh, and I would suggest, although we don't have the, the, the data to back it up, but I would suggest that that increase picks up largely people who are now working from home and consuming coffee uh, at home while they work. The out of home has dropped by around 2% and the workplace figure has dropped by around 3%. So uh, perhaps the workplace is still slightly higher than some of us might have uh, expected to see. Um, so if we can move on to the, uh, the next. So we talked about the, the number of coffee shops and here we're just looking at, at this stage at the branded coffee outlets. So some research that was done earlier or published earlier this year. And you can see that the UK has around a quarter of all of the branded coffee shops uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we'll, we'll consider ourselves as, as being part of Europe for, for this statistic uh, and comparing that with, with Germany at, at around 14%. And the European figures suggest that uh, of that, uh, split, and I think Holger talked about the 40, 45,000, I think, outlets in, in Europe as, as, as a whole. Uh, you'll see McCafe is is there in the number one slot, followed by Starbucks, uh, with uh, probably a more UK-centric business cost coming up in, in, in sort of third place. But if we move to, to look at the next slide, which brings that down a little bit more to the UK situation, you'll see we have split here um, the total coffee shop picture for the UK between branded stores and independent stores. And you'll see interestingly, although we, we, we look at the, the size of the of the branded uh, number of outlets in Europe as a whole, you'll see when we get into the UK, uh, over half of the number of shops are independent. So they, they are small chains um, or, or single ownership uh, coffee shops. 
And you'll see that in if we look in the to the right hand side of that pie chart, the branded sector, um, Costa uh, was third in in Europe, comes out in first place in in the UK. Second goes to, to Greg's, which uh, if you know it is is a, a, a retailer of coffee, but also a retailer of a lot of bakery products, um, has become very popular in the UK in in the last couple of decades. Uh, you'll see Starbucks coming in at at six percent in in three, and then seventeen percent uh, within other uh, branded outlets, um, Cappuccino, Pret, etc. Would be those. So it does show that actually the UK has a very strong independent coffee shop sector. We have around twenty five thousand uh, coffee shops in total. But also important to note. That's not the end of how people consume coffee out of home, because in addition to those 25, 24, 25,000 coffee shops, there are a whole lot of other ways of people accessing coffee through vending machines, uh, through express uh, machines, which will sit in uh, service stations, they'll sit in, in garages, in petrol stations, fuel stations, uh, but also in smaller retail outlets. Uh, a smaller supermarkets will often have a machine there that will deliver uh, a wide range of, of coffees on a, an as-to-go basis, so grab and go as, as as we might sort of call it. And and that has, that has been quite an important growth area for the for the the market in in the last sort of five or six years, but certainly in in uh, since the since COVID. Um, so moving on to the uh, next slide. Poncho, if we want to leave a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Switching away from the coffee shop to look at the retail, so uh, looking much more at the in-home market, you'll see there that retail sales went up by 4% in, in 2023. I think that probably reflects back to some of the, the figures that Pavan showed at, at the start. Um, and that retail market is uh, just over £2 billion in, in terms of work. But looking at that 4% as, a, as an increase, you'll see that fresh beans, whole beans, uh, will rose by 12% in, in that same period. And I think that, that shows a, a, a longer term increase in the percentage of the, of the whole uh, fresh bean market as opposed to, to freshly ground. Um, and, and as we'll, we'll come on to in a moment, as capsules as well. Um, so that overall retail fresh coffee market is just over 41,000 tonnes in total. And, and you'll see, although we've talked about whole beans um, becoming a bigger percentage, the, the, the volume is still within the, the ready ground uh, market at, at 35,500 tonnes. Um, capsules, again, you'll see on that second bullet point, I think Holger talked about around about 30% of, of German homes having their own capsule machine. Very similar in the UK, perhaps surprising that it's only 30%, uh, with around 1.2 billion capsules being uh, being purchased annually. Um, slight increase in the last couple of, or the last five years, from 2018, where the, the, the market was 42%, up to around 43.5% of the market. Starting to slow, I think, a little bit, and we'll come on to, to look at some, some forward projections in a moment. But I just sort of thought I would also make the point that although we've seen a lot of interest in compostable capsules in the last few years, the figures suggest that over 99, well, 99.9% .9 of the market is still in plastic and aluminium. And that hasn't really changed over the last sort of four or five years. So, and, and very also for the UK, interesting to note, we're in a slightly different situation to the rest of Europe in terms of how capsules particularly plastic and aluminium, are seen from a regulatory point of view. Uh, so at the moment, not seen as packaging. Um, and in the UK, we have an industry-funded scheme called Podback, which has just reached out just over 1 million customers. Um, it pro provides a couple of different ways in which people can uh, recycle and, and recover their, their spent capsules and, and send them back to, to, to be re, uh, to be recycled and recovered. Um, you can do that either through your local authority, so they are picking them up curbside, or as I do in my situation where my local authority doesn't do that, I take them to a, to a local retailer and, and they're, they're sent back from there. 
Um, so that again is a growing part of the of the market um, and has been for the last three or four years. So just let's look at one or two sort of forward trends. I think only a couple of, of slides left now. So you'll see on the left hand side some figures for 2023, which relate to the, the fresh market, whole beans, ground and, and capsules. Uh, and you'll see the projection going forward to, to 2028, whole beans still gaining ground. So moving from 14 to 17% to of, of, of that overall market. Uh, ground coffee slipping a little bit, but still the, the sort of the bulk there. Uh, and I mentioned that, that capsules had been growing, but that growth was looking to, to sort of slide slightly. And you'll see that the projections uh, from Statista are that we'll see a around about a 2% drop in the in the capsule market. Um, and, and over that same period, retail value will move from 2.1 to 2.3 billion pounds. The interesting one, I guess, is, is what's happening to the, to the soluble market over that same period. Uh, and you'll see that at the moment, soluble is around 81% of that fresh uh, market. So the whole beans, ground and capsules put together. Um, and we know that in the UK, the soluble market has been gradually sort of declining over the last few years. That decline was arrested a little bit over uh, COVID and, and the cost of living period. But the forecast is to, to see that decline actually increase quite significantly over the next what, four and a half, five years. So that when we get to 2028, that soluble market will only be around 60% of uh, when compared against the, the fresh and ground. So quite a significant change uh, going forward. And we'll wait to see whether those projections uh, come true. So I think just moving on to look at one or two uh, consumer demands. And I think it, it is fair to say that the UK market continues to show great interest in innovation. Um, and within that, there are some generational sort of factors as, as we'll come on to. The ready to drink market um, is forecast to be worth around 153 million pounds by 2020, although some estimates do put it much higher than that. Um, that's from around just over 100 million um, at the moment. And I think if we look at what's driving the UK market and where we see it sort of moving, uh, where it's moved in the last few years, where it's going to move in, in, the, in the, the next few years coming forward, we see that flavours will continue to be a, a dominant uh, factor. Um, and you'll see we've, we've put one or two examples up, up there and, and, you know, companies are, are coming up uh, all the time with with new and interesting sort of flavors and again something that appeals much more to the to the younger generation and particularly those with with higher disposable income because often a lot of these products sort of sit more towards the premium end of the market we are seeing continued drive in, in the uk for healthier options um particularly seeing that in the some of the independent sort of sector and that tends to sort of focus on removing sugar from 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 the drinks and and also looking at uh, at dairy alternatives and we've, we've heard earlier on about sort of vegan um and a whole range of non-dairy milks that are that are coming to the market in in various sort of forms and, and that continues to be a, a a push on on the market as a whole and i think again in looking to the younger generation much more interest in convenience and that comes back to some of these um uh, ways of getting coffee that are, are the sort of grab and go that I talked about earlier on. So much more, more widely available now, less waiting time and just fits that purchase to go trend, which we're, we're seeing much more in, in the younger generations. And also, I guess, more focused around the specialty market and to some extent in that younger generation, the overall issue around sustainability and the growing awareness around climate and packaging and EUPR has been mentioned, but that's just one of a number of, of things that are, that are, that are uh, focusing people's minds. I think the interesting one to look at going forward is as we start to see the cost of living issues fade, certainly within the UK, we see that continuing demographic change. Will we see an increase in the premium the premium end of the of the market and partly that could well be driven by this constantly changing product mix the introduction of coffee into alcohol into other forms as well which again is something which is is, is favored more by younger generations than, than perhaps a more traditional coffee drinking uh generation and then finally i mentioned their cold brew again a growing sector um 
I use, often use my daughter as an example. You know, she, until a couple of years ago, as, as a, somebody in her mid twenties, she hadn't drunk coffee hot. She'd always drunk it cold. Um, interested in in cold brew, and and as an association, we're we're looking at how we react to that, and maybe bringing in some guidance to to, to ensure that the the industry as a whole understands where cold brew sits and and what 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 guidance or best practice should should sit around that. Um, so I think those are the areas that 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 are, will will see more and more prominent uh, going forward. And as I say, I think you know, leaving with that that first point again, that from a UK point of view, uh, a very innovative market, and I think we see that continuing into the future. Uh, so conscious we're a little short on time, but happy to take some questions. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, uh, Pavan, for taking us on a journey through the global consumption trends in coffee and putting a spotlight on the emerging markets and the European markets, and also Holger and Paul. Thank you for your time and taking us on a deep dive into the consumption patterns in the German and the British coffee markets, respectively. As we have gone through this webinar, we have received some questions. Uh, we are conscious of time. Probably there will be a short overrun on account of the questions that we have received. Without further ado, I just put up the first question. It's a two-parter. I put up the first question to Holger, and then uh, perhaps, Pavan, you are best placed to answer the second question. And the question is, with the growth in consumption in uh, the emerging markets uh, forecasted in your slides, and part of that consumption being driven by Robustas in those markets, the first question is, what implication could that have on the usage of Robustas in Europe? And the second part to this question is that, can the world produce enough Robustas? to cater to this demand. Holger, over to you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there are actually three parts. First part is, does the consumer want to have more Robusta? Um, we always recognize once the brands, the roasters change the recipe, uh, every roaster is concerned about the reaction of the consumer. Would the consumer appreciate it or would the consumer be irritated by the change of the recipe? First question. Second question is, uh, um, what is the worldwide production of Robusta and how will it be in the future? There are better experts than I am. Uh, I'm an expert of the German market, but not on the, on the coffee production side, sorry. Um, and the third part is the price of Robusta, what we have seen in the last weeks and months. And this brings me uh, to a very different story. I still wonder why Robusta is not seen part of Robusta as specialty. And I think there's huge potential to introduce Robusta, parts of Robusta as specialty. And uh, once we have um, succeeded to place that one, we can introduce also lower grades of Robusta and the mainstream products because then the consumer is more and more educated to the taste of Robusta, which does not have to be a bad taste. I would, leave, I would like to insist. So we need to educate the consumer that there are excellent Robustas on the market. And once we have done that one, we can, uh, we can uh, come up with even more Robusta to the market for the consumer. On the production side, there are better experts than I am, sorry. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll probably Robert try and tackle the second part of the question regarding uh, the uh, Robusta production. So there, uh, to me, I think uh, one main factor that can predict the future production of beet, Arabica, or Robusta is really the farmer margin. Uh, as we stand today, uh, the margin the Robusta producer is enjoying, let's say, be it in the Brazilian Conilon region or the Vietnam producer, is probably uh, one of the uh, richest uh, we've seen in history. So I think based on that, uh, if you look at uh, the prospects of production, particularly in uh, Brazil, it's definitely expanding. We are hearing about uh, increasing acreage, the farmer is pretty happy. We are talking about record high prices. And Vietnam, again, is a very efficient producer, is very quick to switch gears between uh, you know one commodity to the other. And currently, coffee is probably one of the more lucrative commodities. So really, 
from a producer margin point of view, the prospects, the future prospects for the Robusta production increases are really there. It's pretty clear. Uh, the other side is really, you know, Robusta as it is, is uh, a crop which can probably be easy to easier to expand uh, compared to Arabica because uh, it is grown on a lower uh, elevation compared to Arabica. And it is a, a more reliable kind of a crop because it is less prone to the weather risks uh, versus, let's say, the Arabicas. So from both, uh, you know, uh, technical point of view and the farmer margin point of view, I think uh, the growth story for uh, Robusta is very, very strong. Thanks, Pavan, for taking up that question. And thanks, Olga, for your comments on the consumption part. Moving on to the second question, very interesting, and we'd like to pose this to Paul and then Holger for your comments, if any. Uh, the question is pertaining to alternative caffeinated products, and the question is that how do you think that is impacting coffee consumption, especially uh, also reflecting back on your slides on the current generation and the products that they have as options in the market? So what do you think is the impact of these alternative caffeinated products such as tea, energy drinks, which is synthetic caffeine, and mate, et cetera, in terms of coffee consumption in your respective markets. Paul, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, there's not a lot of data available, but I think anecdotally it would suggest that although although some of these products are increasing in, in popularity, it's probably alongside existing coffee consumption. So we're seeing an overall rise in consumption rather than one swapping out the, the other. Um, I think, you know, if you look at certainly at caffeinated products, they are, you know, increasingly popular. Um, again, <laughs> looking at members of my own family, there's, you know, some of them seem to have them, you know, at least on a daily basis. Um, I think in terms of the sort of synthetic caffeine, et cetera, uh, or non-coffee coffee, as we might like to look at it, and some of the products that have been coming from, from the, the U.S., I don't see a lot of impact uh, in the U.K. market on those at the moment seen some reaction that suggests from people that have tried them they're interesting but they don't replace coffee from a from a taste and a flavor point of view so i think you know we will see some come into the market but it's maybe more about how they influence overall consumption rather than swapping out coffee consumption for for those particular products thanks paul holger would you like to add any comments from your side on this the question you raised is exactly uh, from the deep of our concerns, and we have uh, done a special survey on that one, uh, which uh, we expect to have the results end of May uh, in our consumption study. So end of May, we will answer exactly these questions, uh, energy drinks, smart uh, tea, etc. Uh, what is the link between coffee and these other uh, beverages? Thanks, Olga. Thanks, Paul, for the for the answer to that. We have a few other questions, but in interest of time, we just go ahead with this one last question. And it's uh, perhaps to all three of you, and I could uh, any of you could just go and take it in that order. The question refers to uh, two things, regulatory environments and sustainability. And the question is, how do these changing regulatory environments and sustainability standards, what is the impact that they are having or are expected to have? on consumption on a global scale and especially in the European markets. So uh, whoever wants to bite the bullet first, please take it from me. I think we will see a totally different world of coffee trade, coffee roasting in the next 10 years. Uh, we need to invent all our business cases again, just to stay in the business. When we see all the upcoming legislations, EODR, CS, uh, Triple D, CSRD, forced labor, just to continue to make business, every business partnership, how to buy, how to sell, how to process, how to manage the data need to be reinvented. So it's a biggest task uh, of the last 100 years, I would say, uh, for the coffee sector. Um, it's not about sustainability, it's about compliance, IT, and uh, governance. Thanks, Olga. Uh, Paul, would you uh, go next on this? 
Yeah, I, I think just to sort of, I guess, just to add to that, I mean, it, it will be a very different situation. I think the one area that perhaps we don't sort of talk about is is the mitigation. You know, what 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 will be the mitigation for some of these sort of issues? And I think as an industry, and 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 I make it probably coming having spent most of my career in other industries, I think there are opportunities for us to look for us to look at other commodity sectors, how they face some of these challenges, and how we sort of learn from them, because there are opportunities to mitigate and, and they probably need to be brought more to the fore to 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 compass or to deal with some of these you know very big regulatory challenges that that you know hold as i sort of summarized just now and, and that are you know on the doorstep they are happening if not immediately within the next sort of two three years all of them excuse me thanks paul Pawan, any comments on this question from your side yeah, just a quick take on uh, probably the wave on sustainability. I think that's uh, that's a theme that is uh, running deep in uh, several pockets, probably across the globe. So I guess from a consumption point of view, I think the end consumer will also be uh, more geared towards, uh, you know, being sensitive, I would say, towards a sustainable kind of a living and uh, the products that they use uh, will also be, uh, you know, uh, they will probably demand for a sustainable kind of a setup. So from that point of view, I guess uh, the traction and uh, the tailwind for sustainable coffee is going to be very strong. So I guess uh, it will be more consumer driven. And as a result, I think the producer, the trade and the regulators will have to sort of, uh, you know, cater to that uh, demand for, from the end consumer. Uh, well, just my take, but yeah, let's see. Well, with that, I would just like to give my sincere thanks to all three of you, Pavan, uh, Holger, and Paul, for your time and for sharing with us your thoughts today, for sharing with us this data. This uh, Really, it was a deep dive on all the aspects of consumption across the world and then in your respective markets in Germany and the UK. Again, a sincere thanks to also to the participants who have hung on with us. Uh, we have overran by nine minutes, but thank you all for participating today, for uh, posing us with your questions and for joining us for this event. I wish you all a very good day and a good week ahead and looking forward to seeing all of you in some of our upcoming events. Thank you.